Welcome to the Waves Slate's podcast about gender, feminism, and how we get through the challenges that we've been facing lately. Every episode, you get a new pair of women to talk about the thing that we cannot get off of our minds. And today you've got me, Daisy Rosario. I'm senior supervising producer of audio here at Slate. And today I'm going to be talking to two women who wrote a book together. Today, I'm going to be joined by Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar, real-life sisters and co-writers of the new book, The World Record Book of Racist Stories. You might know Amber from Late Night with Seth Meyers, where she does the very hilarious recurring bit, Amber Says What? Or even better, from her own show, The Amber Ruffin Show, which you can catch on Peacock, which is, of course, NBC's streaming service. Lacey Lamar is Amber's real-life sister, and though she is not a comedian, she is also herself very, very funny. Amber and Lacey are real-life sisters who grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. And this book is their second book. Their first book was called You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey, Crazy Stories About Racism. And most of those stories really center a lot on Lacey's experience living in Nebraska. With this book, they are now expanding out to include stories of their other siblings, as well as their parents and some of their friends. The book is both hilarious and incredibly maddening. That genuinely is the best way I can describe it, because these are real stories of racist things that happen to Lacey and other people. I myself am a woman of color, so I definitely related to a lot to some of these stories, uh, have seen these things in action, have experienced a few of them myself. Um, but the way that they write this book just felt so real, because for me and for so many people I know who have to deal with racism, sometimes you just have to laugh at it to get through the day. If you've ever seen Amber perform, you know that she is hilarious. And I have to say, it was always so much fun to perform with her. So we are going to take a very quick little break here. But when we come back, we're going to dig right into my conversation with Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar. Hey, Waves listeners, if you're loving the show and you want to hear more, subscribe to our feed. New episodes come out every Thursday morning. And while you're there, check out our other episodes, too, like last week's about the new show Fleischman is in Trouble, which featured an interview with the creator of the show, the showrunner herself, and the woman who wrote the book that it's based on, Taffy Brodesser Ackner. And she was in conversation with our own Emily Peck. So definitely go check out that episode and make sure to subscribe to The Waves. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm now joined by Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar, real-life sisters and authors of the new book, The World Record Book of Racist Stories. Amber and Lacey, welcome to The Waves. Yay! Thanks for having us. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. So this is the second book that they have written in a similar theme where they are sharing the stories of everyday racism that has to be endured, particularly by Black Americans, but honestly, by many, many different kinds of people of color and immigrants in different scales. And one of the things that's really special about this book in general and the previous book is just the humor that's in it, which is something that I know I could relate to so much in the sense that you kind of almost have to laugh at some of these situations when they happen because they will drive you crazy. They'll probably also drive you crazy even if you're laughing, but it does help long term. So I do want to ask kind of just to get started, like what made you write another book about this topic? Lacey, do you want to do you want to start with this one? Do you want to take this? Um, We didn't get to put everything into the first book. I feel like we have so many stories. We were like, we could do another book, definitely. I mean, we just had so many stories. And then, and we wanted to add in our family and then people in the community. So a second book was demanded. Yeah. (laughs) What about you, Amber? After the first book was written, stuff kept happening to Lacey. Like she still exists. (laughs) You know, so it just even. and this is something we didn't do, but we should have. We should have made one of the chapters just things that have happened since the first book. It would have been the longest chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things that I do really 
enjoy about the book is that kind of the references to the fact that like, yes, there already was another book and like the amount of things that have happened since and kind of mentioning, even though obviously you didn't get to get into all of it, but things like when Lacey is at the mall and like meets the women in the mall who work there who are like, we read that book. We love that book. And then she immediately has another example of the same thing happened to her in the same store, just like in the next apartment over just felt so real to me. Like I was just like, oh, yes, exactly. In the last book, we had a whole chapter about how Lacey was forever followed around at JCPenney. Well, like mother, like daughter, because mom was followed around JCPenney, too. Okay, mom used to wear this really cute leather cape. It was a hard to explain capey shawl thing, like a short poncho. It was so cute, and I have no clue where it ended up. If I found it, I would wear it tomorrow, and you would be gagging. Side note, mom will dress out. She used to make her own clothes, and in the 70s was quite the fashion plate. So every time mom would come to JCPenney in this cape, they'd follow her. She'd buy whatever merchandise she came to buy and walk out to the van. And every time there was a guy watching her who had followed her out to the parking lot, waiting to see if she took anything out from her shirt. I asked her if she ever took out two middle fingers and showed him those. I got in trouble. So years before I was followed around the store for years, mom was followed around that store for years. She would have told us sooner, but, and this is important, she forgot. That's the number of stories we are dealing with. So I would love to hear a little bit more of kind of, particularly for you, Lacey, who still does live in Nebraska. That's obviously a big part of the book is that the Ruffin family grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, settling there after their parents lived there in during the Air Force and then deciding to raise their children there. In general, I would imagine at large that you already hear enough of like, there's black people in Nebraska because I I hear it and I'm not from Nebraska. I hear it just working in journalism. <laughs> but specifically you being, you know, Lacey, the person who still does live in the area that you grew up in. I mean, what was some of that reception like for you and particularly locally? It was great by people of color and by um, non-people of color. Every Everybody loved, we, we thought we were going to get for the first book and the second book, um, uh, we thought we were going to, uh, people were going to be upset and we were going to get a lot of negative responses. That did not happen. In fact, we still had a lot of people saying, are you going to do a second book? There's got to be a second book, you know? And so I was like, of course, there's going to be a second book. Our response to the book was amazing. We were shocked that it did so well or, or that people just weren't upset by it. Of course, we have people that said, oh, is racism really that bad? And I got a couple of, you know, messages, but they weren't even that terrible. Some people, I, I think I talked about uh, the first book, how a woman contacted me and said, you know, I was reading it and I thought that story was about me, but that, I don't think it was about me. And I said, yeah, that, that was about you. <laughs> you. That was you. But most of our responses were great. Since you were surprised by it, can I ask like, why, why do you think it was uh, after the fact that you that you were getting this response? Like, do you think it was the humor? Do you think it was the way that you shared these stories? I think how we told the stories eased ra racism in there. For white people, I'm just, I'm just going to be honest, because black people know this stuff is happening all the time. This book makes sharp things easier to swallow. And because Amber is hilarious, we like to tell jokes, we like to be goofy and silly, we tell these stories and then white people are laughing like, oh, OK, that that is racism. And yeah, I might be doing that, too. It's like it eased it in there. If we were like, you guys are racist, you're terrible, you do this, this and this. It is the way the storytelling went that made it easier for people to be like, yeah, I do that. Yeah, my grandma does this all the time. Yeah. People know Amber from Late Night with Seth Meyers and her hilarious Amber Ruffin show, which is on Peacock. Go get Peacock, even if only for that. But I think in general, like obviously with with Amber being known as a comedian, I would imagine that there is some kind of expectation like, oh, well, also that you kind of did this from a comedic perspective because Amber is a comedian. But I do wonder how much of that kind of sense of comedy also just comes from your family and in a way of kind of laughing at these things to get through them. This book 
came out as a comedy. What I mean by came out, I mean came out of our mouths as <laughs> as comedy because that's who we are. And I think like when white people when white people read the book, they think, "Oh no, that's so sad. Everybody's feelings are so hurt." But that's not how minorities move through the world. It's hilarious. This shit is hilarious all the time. It's daily and it's hilarious. You know what I mean? Like because of television, we all think of racism as one big event that destroys a community or some shit. Real racism is every single day and it's unrelenting. And you can tell that people think it's funny because they're still sane. You know what I mean? Either either it's funny to you or you are having a difficult life. Chapter five. Don't go in that store. It's always nice paying actual money to be someone's racist experiment. You walk into a store and you walk out with a new understanding of how terrible the world is. Here are the winners for Worst Car Service. I was on my way to the airport, so I decided to take an Uber there. I use Uber all the time in New York, but it is nothing like Omaha. I mean, not even close. More times than not, I get the most interesting driver you can imagine. This time, my driver was an older white woman. As I get into her car, she immediately changes the station from Easy Rock to the rap station. This also happens to me all the time. It's sad. I'm so used to it. As the music is playing, she raises her voice so I can hear her. Hey, how about just turning the music down? Anyway, this woman says, you know, my boyfriend says that you guys are all on CP time, but not you. You came out right away. So I guess not all colored people are late. Oh, my boyfriend is black, by the way. Really? Why didn't he teach you not to repeat that phrase? You were dumb enough to actually say CP time, then made it worse by saying colored people? Did you know that there is a way you can complain about your driver? Did you know that it's next to impossible to get a response? Now, having taken these cars everywhere, I can tell you they should already have a canned response they send to everyone who complains. Here, I'll even write it for you. Dear customer name, we are sorry about the racism you experienced while being trapped in the car with a stranger. It is unacceptable behavior for the driver to have touched your hair, called you colored, gone on and on about how poor people are just lazy. Although it makes for a good story, we feel bad about it. The driver will receive a sternly worded email. Have fun deleting our app in anger and then re-downloading it. Love, Uber. We're going to take a quick break and we will be right back with our guests Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar to talk more about their new book, which shares just the wildest array of racist stories that you've ever heard. We'll be right back with The Waves. Also, please consider supporting the show by joining Slate Plus. Members get benefits like zero ads on any Slate podcast and bonus content of shows like this one. It's only $1 for the first month. To learn more, go to slate.com forward slash the waves plus. This episode of The Waves is brought to you by Amazon Music. Actress, singer, entrepreneur, and everyone's favorite Virgo, Kiki Palmer, has a hilarious new podcast called Baby, This is Kiki Palmer on Amazon Music, and you're going to want to check it out. Kiki has a lot of burning questions that keep her up at night. She's putting friends, family, and some of the hottest experts in the hot seat to ask them the real questions that we really want to know. Like, is only fans only bad? How has dating changed in the digital age? Where would former child stars be if they weren't actors? These are just some of the questions running through Kiki's mind, and she's letting us in on it all. Because on Baby, This is Kiki Palmer, no topic is off limits. Listen to Baby, This is Kiki Palmer exclusively on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app now. This episode of The Waves is brought to you by Cook Unity. Getting delivery is kind of like having a bad date. It's supposed to be quick, easy, and drama-free, but it never really is. It happens late at night, and it's never on time. It's never as hot as you hope, and it usually leaves you full of regret. Maybe it's time to break up with delivery and try something better. You could be inviting a different chef over every night with Cook Unity. 
the first Chef to Eater platform, Cook Unity connects a diverse chef collective with food lovers to create an elevated at home dining experience. Through the weekly subscription, eaters can select from a wide array of fully prepared dishes handcrafted by talented chefs. With quality ingredients and hundreds of fresh, creative meals, you'll never have to resort to swiping again. You might even want to light candles. Sign up at cookunity.com slash breakupwithdelivery and get 50% off your first week with the code WAVES. Welcome back. I am here with Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar, authors of the new book, The World Record Book of Racist Stories. Before the break, we were talking about the way that the humor that is in the book is not something that is put on. It's not a layer. You didn't write a book full of serious stories and then go, let's add jokes to make this easier. Like that came from who you are. But another thing I love about this book, because it does focus on stories that have been experienced by your entire family, I felt like you could also see throughout the book because of the way that you talked about your family, how much you really did have like a loving beautiful, seemingly very funny family unit that really gave you, you know, just a good core of who you are. And when it comes to things like racism and the way that we experience it so constantly in the world, I know for me, I have found that like looking back, I realize how much having my family just like give me a hundred percent, no doubt that I was a valuable human being in this world like really did set me up for as soon as I got outside and was like constantly being told by people that I was not valuable in the world. And I felt like that energy of your family comes through in this book. Oh, yeah. There's no bigger support system than mom alone. (laughs) (laughs) I remember finding out that she had told everyone. I thought this was a special message to me. But she had told everyone at one point or another, you're the smartest child in this class. And if anyone else thinks they're the smartest, they're mistaken. (laughs) And she said that to everybody. (laughs) It's so lovely to hear about like such affirming parents, though. And I think people do underestimate how kind of essential that is to surviving the day to day of these constant micro and macro aggressions. There's a whole chapter in the book of stories that are actually from white friends in your life of things that they got away with, things that they're aware that they got away with because they are white. Like just just wild descriptions of things that should have been a problem and ended up being not a problem. Cops giving their all to protect my friend, MB. My good friend, MB, who is a white lady, and I love to trade opposite stories. Stories where I'm suffering some racist nonsense and she's getting away with everything but murder. It's so shocking to me. I can't believe this is happening to my little bud. Being white is hilarious. So as you hear these next five stories, try to think about how out of place they are in this book. Try to imagine a black man getting away with any of this. It's fun because you can't. Here are MB's stories. Story 1, 2018. I got pulled over going 55 in a 35. I had two Christmas ales, and while I didn't feel intoxicated, I was very aware that I might not pass a breathalyzer, so I quickly crammed a handful of peanut butter pretzels in my mouth, realized I didn't have any water to wash them down with, and was practically choking when the officer arrived at my window. I had my ID ready, but when I started reaching for my glove box to grab my registration, the officer said, oh, I don't need to see anything else. I was silently bargaining with my higher power, happy to get a speeding ticket in exchange for not having to do a field sobriety test. Him. Do you know how fast you were going? Me. I do not, but I totally trust that I was speeding and I'm so sorry. Him. You were going 55 and a 35. At first I couldn't tell if it was you or the silver car in front of you, but then you passed him. Me. Oh, yes. Again, I'm so sorry. Him. Okay. I'll just give you a warning this time. Happy holidays. He did not write me a warning, run my license, ask if I'd been drinking, or any other incriminating questions. The whole interaction was over in less time than it had taken me to find a good spot to pull over. I just kept reading it and feeling like so much of the humor was also comes from this place of like, I 
everybody's kind of constantly telling me the opposite of what I am seeing with my own eyes is true. And like, how do I get through this? I mean, how do you feel about kind of that core thing in your work in general, in your comedy in general, and you're like, here's, you know, speaking of some kind of truth that you see. It was a cool thing for us to put those white stories (laughs) in the book because that's where they can see it. You know, like racism is a wall and the tiny hole in it is their privilege. Like they may not be able to see the whole picture, but they can certainly see how they're getting away Mm -hmm. with murder and, you know, and that we are not. And it's something that has just always been and I think always will be. I see it every day. I see it all the time. White, Especially living in Nebraska, where you are definitely the the minority. Uh, You see white privilege all the time. I see white privilege every time I walk into a store and I'm like, ain't nobody going to greet me. Let me go get this stuff. You know, you see it. It is so, and you just become used to it. I see it when I go into a store and I... Ha- I'm I'm the one also being followed and the white people are not. And I, I, I tell this story all the time. I had come to New York and Amber and I were in this uh, department store and I had to get, I had a huge purse and I had to get something out of the bottom of it. And I said, oh, oh, I can't stick my hand in my purse because it, Amber said, no one cares about you here. Look at all the black people around you. No one's looking at you. And I had to be like, oh, they're not. They don't care. But in Omaha, you cannot just stick your hand in your purse like that without them being like, she just put something in there. Let's let's follow her. White privilege is definitely a thing. And you just become used to it, which is sad, but you just become used to it. I have just literally don't carry a purse anymore. <laughs> she does not. I don't. I don't want. I, my purse is big enough for me to put Amber inside <laughs> of and just carry her around. And she does. She's quite strong. (laughs) Uh, As I was reading the book, I mean, it it also reminded me of like times I've had conversations with, um, you know, just like male friends, but specifically just more about the way that like women get harassed on the street. Thinking about it in the sense of like, usually it would be like if I'm meeting up with one of them to have a drink at a bar in the pre-pandemic times uh, when that happened more casually after work, you know, I'd probably get harassed two or three times on the way there. And then I get there and I'm not talking about it because it happens all the time and it's not what I want to fixate on. And because it happens all the time and it's not what I want to fixate on, they don't think it's true. I personally, I think would just looking at the people I spend time with in my life, feel like that's actually the side I have to try to make them understand more because a significant portion of the people in my life are also not white. So like they know. Um, But how much of uh, that have you experienced in kind of not with this book, but in terms of like the lead up to wanting to write this book in terms of like you're sharing something that's obviously a wild anecdote and people are like, well, you know, maybe it's they could just be, you know, they didn't mean it like, you know, um, because I think of at least you, Amber, is a very no nonsense, like all the nonsense, the fun nonsense, but no nonsense about some of those things. How much of that, like, you know, this book came from kind of having those experiences of sharing such anecdotes and, you know, maybe people because they're hearing it as a one off thinking, oh, well, you know, you just read too much into that situation. Well, that happens all the time. It, it happened to me all the time, especially when I was at work and the racist things were happening. And I would, that's why I kept my log. I don't know if we, so the first book was written because I had so many, um, I had written down so many things that had happened to me at work just to go to complain to HR, just to be like, this is a pattern. This happened to me today. This happened to me yesterday. I would write down all these racist events. And then after a while, they can't deny it. They can't be like, "Mm, yeah, Timmy is saying this every day (laughs) because they will deny it in a minute. Oh, they didn't mean that. They they did not mean to call you Negro. They, You know, just, yeah. Oh, people deny and deny and deny. So you got to keep that evidence to show them, no, this is a pattern. This is real. And even if I complain once about it, it's real. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's part of why we wrote the book is just because of the sheer volume of the stories. It's constant. It's daily. You would never freaking believe it. And it was hard to believe ourselves once you see a thick ass book full of stories. It's a it's a book. It's a real book. We're on book two. And largely it's about one tiny lady. It's hilarious. The amount of event it, it's yeah, it's uh she should be a lot older for this stuff. Right. <laughs> for the amount of stuff that's I, happened. I will still have people come up to me and they're like, I can't believe you didn't write about this. Yep. Or or one of the stories in the book, they'll be like, But remember after that happened, then this 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 happened. And I'm like, Oh my god, you are right. How did I forget about that? Because there's too many things. Too many things. There are too many stories. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, sad but true. Uh, I absolutely believe that. Um, One of the other things about the stories in both books that I really appreciate and that to me was not even a question is just how much they highlight how illogical racism is, like how illogical your interactions will be. And I feel like particularly, again, working in journalism, having conversations behind the scenes, I find that... I feel like the fact that it doesn't seem logical unless you understand that it's racism is part of the hump of getting over with like other people in terms of understanding it, right? Like they're just like, I don't understand why somebody would make a choice that would be actually detrimental to them. And you're like, you've seen it your whole life. You've seen people doing wild stuff in wild moments. And there's just so many great examples in the book. And I feel like that just like the sheer absurdity of the conversations is really hard for people to understand. I feel like white people don't understand a lot about racism, but I feel like that is one thing that they just genuinely like they expect it to make sense. Yeah. They white people expect racism to make sense they also they expect racist people to be a cartoon racist instead of themselves them. <laughs> like that's also another thing we wanted to do like we wanted the racist people to be like the sweet old lady, the loving mommy, the adorable baby is these people. It's not a special person you've never met. It's everybody you know. And yourself. And your damn it's, self. It's you. <laughs> and the situations weren't like I was at a rally on racism and you called me the N-word and threw a rock. That's what you think all racism is. But it's you saying, let us see, um... You have a mother and a father, you know, wow. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, 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 it can be subtle as well. And they don't see that as being racist. I was just asking questions. I was just, no, it's you too. You're, yeah. you're in there. I was working at a retirement home and a white coworker was trying to talk to me about race during the morning meeting. We have just had a very serious conversation about a resident who refuses to be helped by black staff. This person does nothing but berate Black employees with racial slurs and sometimes physically tries to harm them. As I'm explaining how difficult it is to work with this resident and how several staff members are thinking about quitting because of him, my white co-worker chimes in, and I am not kidding you when I tell you this woman says, I understand how hard it is being Black. Have you ever heard of the Black Dog campaign? Girl, so you know about being paralyzed with fear? Well, at this moment, I was paralyzed with racism. I know exactly what this woman's next words will be, and I know that they will be so racist that I'll remember them forever. Yet I am unable to stop the impending doom, or rather, the impending dumb. I'm trying to figure out who in the world I can call to bail me out of jail. Who am I kidding? My bail will be set too high, and I will spend the rest of my life in prison. Deep breath. (sighs) This woman says, you know... Black dogs never get adopted, so it's very hard for them in the shelters because they are the first to be euthanized. Please, in the name of sweet black baby Jesus, explain to me what this has to do with this conversation. We are talking about human beings, and this bitch is like, all dogs matter. Anyways, after she says that, I fight her and spend the rest of my life in jail. Just kidding, but I wish I had. 
Amber, obviously you live uh, in New York now to work on the show. And it's also something that you talk about in the book is that, you know, since you've been spending more time in New York, you're like not having to deal with as many obviously wild lacy moments, like, or at least the ones that play out in the style of, you know, what is described in the book. Uh, But I would love to hear just because we are a slate podcast and I know we got a lot of listeners in the big cities, like, you know, give us an example of how that has, how you've had a similar experience, even in a place like New York. Oh man, these people are crazy, dude. Um, it's, <laughs> it's everywhere. It really is. First of all, the cops are almost worse. Cop will, uh, will get you no matter what city you're in. But here in New York, we have a lot more black cops and that's safer. Um, <laughs> but, um, I've certainly worked on projects where I'm fully ignored until something black happens. Like, that's for sure. They'll, we'll all have, you know, be putting together a script or something. And then when the black person talks, everybody looks at me. Meanwhile, I have jokes that you all poo pooed when it came out of my mouth. And then three. Sp- People later, it came out of a white mouth and you were like, you know what? That's a good idea. Like that uh, very happens to me. (laughs) It very happens. I would say that that is the main offender. And then there's that like bougie type of thing where you only talk to me about, like I still have friends who only, friends is a strong word, um, who only talk to me about black stuff (laughs) they'll be like oh my gosh insert rap album came out what did you think about it i'm "I'm 43 i haven't listened to a new rap album since time began rap what no man i'm old it's too loud you know what i listen to mumbling (laughs) smooth jazz i just want to thank you again Real life sisters. I can't stress that part enough because boy, is it part of what makes reading the book just so very, very fun. Lacey Lamar and Amber Ruffin, thank you again for joining me on The Waves. Yay, Daisy and Maisie. We love you. Yay. That is our show this week. The Waves is produced by Shana Roth. Daisy Rosario, that's me, is senior supervising producer of audio. And Alicia Montgomery is the vice president of audio. We would love to hear from you. Please email us at thewaves at slate.com. The Waves will be back next week. Different hosts, different topic, same time and place. Hello, Slate Plus listeners. Thank you so much, as always, for being Slate Plus subscribers. We're continuing our conversation with Lacey Lamar and Amber Ruffin about their book, The World Record Book of Racist Stories. I just think about this. I mean, we kind of touched on this in one of the the previous questions, but I feel like sometimes when I talk to people about racism or, again, working in journalism and having to do work about it, right, that that's not just featuring me, but other people, um, I feel like one of the things that I hear or that maybe I don't think p- white people realize that they're saying this is that when they hear complaints about racism, they almost seem to think that, like, that's the only kind of stress that is happening, as if, like, you're not also like every other person trying to figure out how to pay your bills and take care of your family and have stress at work and have days where you come home and don't want to cook and stuff. It's almost as if there's, they seem to think that it's like you either are dealing with racism or you have like real life problems. And one of the things I love about your book also is that, you know, it just kind of is constantly underlining how not true that is. But knowing that, you know, you wrote this book, I'm curious if that's something that you have seen in the reaction and the way that some people talk about it. I know you said the reaction has mostly been really positive, um, but just knowing that there's press, there's marketing, like I'm wondering if kind of the fact that people tend to define racism as like this very separate human experience as if the other human experience is not also happening is something that you've seen and experienced. Yes, that is true. But the good part about that is racism is fun and we could all, I'm just kidding. Um, but the good, <laughs> the good part about it is white people are like, white people are, are never like 
if that happened to me, well, I would just blah, blah, blah. That's rare. What's most likely is white people are like, if that happened to me, I would lay down and cry until I died from it. People yes. are very honest about how they could not handle this stuff. And that is, that makes me feel like it's getting in there. You know what I mean? I I think that people are like, this is too, this one happening is too much for a person. But when you make it daily, I don't know how you are doing it. They haven't even put the two things together. You know what I mean, Daisy? Like what you're saying is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's still too much to handle. A fraction of the little bit is too much for these people to handle. And honestly, I love that. Yeah, I that's the Amber hit the nail on the head. That's one of the main first things that white people will say to me when they come up is, oh, my God, I can't believe you. Uh, this has happened to you. How did you get through all this? I and if I, I wouldn't be able to handle this. And then I say, if you were black, you would be able to handle it because this is, this is your life. What are you going to do? But yeah, that is the main thing that white people say is, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you go through all of this all the time. That was just some of our Slate Plus segment. If you want to hear the whole thing, go to slate.com slash the waves plus to become a Slate Plus member today. Slate.com slash the waves plus.